I have officially cooked up a list of tips and tricks you can utilize on all plants, but more specifically ones that fruit and flower, like peppers and tomatoes and melons and cucumbers, you name it. These are science-based. These are an assortment of different rules I have cultivated over the years for doing my videos when I research through scientific literature, in my opinion, well done trials and my own personal experience. So if you're new around here, geek crew, please welcome the new folk. If you're new, comment down below, say I'm new around here. And I expect a very warm welcome, not only from me, but from everyone else in the geek crew community. Let's get into some science-based growing tips. Okay, number one is actually focusing on watering and less on fertilizer. So the reason why I say watering is because it matters regardless if you're in a container garden, an in-ground, a raised bed, you name it. The reason why it matters is because no matter how much fertilizer you use, it can't be uptaken by a plant unless it is soluble, water soluble. This helps increase and is one of the only ways bioavailability bioavailability is increased or available, accessible to the plant. Think of the plant as a straw. And the only mechanism that that plant has to uptake nutrients is via a liquid. So if it has molecules that are just kind of whole and they're not solubilized in water, that plant cannot uptake it. So you could have all the fertilizer in the world present, it means absolutely nothing because it cannot be used by that plant. So that's why watering is so important. Now, there are two ways you can effectively water, and it actually comes down to how you're gardening. So container gardeners out there, number one is actually watering every single day. Now, I know that seems excessive, and you need to kind of use a little bit of common sense with this, but if you have proper drainage, meaning you have holes in your container, and you have a high porosity soil, such as the Sunshine Mix number four or the Pro Mix HP. These are soils and container settings that I believe you should be watering in daily. This will reduce your chances of blossom and rot. It will reduce the chances of just drooping and poor yields, flower drop, fruit drop, you name it. Every time you see a plant droop or you begin to see a expedited amount of bottom leaf loss, yellowing and following off, this is a sign that you may be under watering. The best way to keep up with this is to water daily. The other way to keep up with this is to use soil moist. It's a, it's a crystal, essentially, that goes into your soil. So you could stay away from high porosities and you could just go with a regular potting soil, which would be anything that doesn't have HP or pro porous mix in the name, add these crystals to that batch and it will actually retain water longer. So that is another mechanism you could use in the future if you don't have the ability to water every single day. Now, if you are in ground or in a large raised bed, the rules change on you once again. You need to water less. And by less, I mean you need to work that plant up to fighting for water earlier in its life cycle. The way I start off my season is while they're in containers, they get all the water they want and love when they're in their nursery pots. The moment they're put into the actual garden, they immediately get water for the first week or two every single day till they start to work their way into the soil. After that, they are on their own, usually for five to seven days. So I water once in the five to seven day period and I water, water heavily, meaning I let the water run in that spot for 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the percolation rates of my soil. So what I mean by that is if I have a sandier soil, I don't have to run it as long, but I will need to consider watering more often. So I would want to water at the five day mark and I would only wanna water for about 30 minutes. Now, if you have a loam or a clay loam or a clay, 
which is highly unlikely, just so you know, I would actually water closer to that 45 minute mark and I would ensure it's done every seven days because my capacity to hold water is much higher, but my percolation rate is going to be much lower. So it's gonna take more time for it to get in. It's going to hold more water at the end of the day. This in turn actually forces the roots to do a little bit of their own work. Plants are lazy, kind of like myself. And if they don't have to reach for that, that soil moisture, they're not going to. So you want to force them to. When they do this, they will put their roots down deeper. They will source their water from different spots in your garden. And this actually makes it easier when August comes around. So these plants in my garden, I actually can go now for extended, quite extended periods of time with absolute zero watering because I have a very large root ball, root mass that is dug down in search of water and fertilizer and nutrients and everything else in between. So think of the beginning of your season kind of like the insurance for the later season. And if you're questioning uh, your ability to water and whether or not you've done a good job at watering, take a look at your garden right now. Look at whether or not you've lost leaves, particularly on the bottom. If you've lost fruits, if you have blossom end rot, or if things are continually very easily beginning to wilt. Those are all signs that you didn't work on your root ball enough. Doesn't mean you're a bad gardener, doesn't mean you suck. Just means you need to pivot based on the climate that you are in, and it is going to take trial and error before you get there. The next one is actually knowing why your leaves are doing weird things, whether they're curling or they're tipping upwards, turning yellow, following, falling off, you name it. You need to be able to identify what's going wrong without panicking and reaching for your organic or your conventional forms of pesticide, in particular fungicides or insecticides. This is pretty darn easy to figure out and I'm gonna give you the tips and tricks to be able to actually identify exactly what's going on with your plants without panicking and thinking it's disease right off the bat. Number one actually starts down here. All your plants as they age, particularly later in the season, such as the end of August like we are, you will notice your leaves turning yellow and falling off. This is totally normal. This is normal so long as it's not happening very quickly and it's just a slow kind of uptick throughout the plant. All plants will experience this. Number two is actually the curling of leaves. So these leaves you can see are kind of curling down and under. Now this would never be caused by bacteria. This would never be caused by fungus. The only thing that could cause this from a pest perspective would be an insect, but they will curl big time if it's an insect. It won't be kind of this gentle curl and it won't pivot. So once the plant receives water, if it perks up, then that's a sign that, that it's not pest. If you notice curling and you don't believe it to be a water issue, I encourage you to actually move that plant if possible out of the sun or add shade cloth. If this remedies the leaves and makes things perk back up, it very likely is a sun issue. If you've put them in a shadier spot, you've added the shade cloth, you're pretty sure that the watering is up to snuff and you still are receiving wilting, you need to do a check on the environment. And if your temps are very high, meaning they're over 30 degrees Celsius in many cases, this is what it is in Fahrenheit, then that's your sign that they're just stressed out by the heat and the rates of evapotranspiration are just much too high. So the turgor pressure is dropping and this drop in turgor pressure causes these droop in leaves. And a great sign of this is when it cools down at night and the plant begins to fluff back up, probably an indication of that being the issue. Now, there's no way to solve this other than shade cloth or a less sunny spot. Uh, it does harm the yield of the plant, but it's a nature tax, folks. And it's just something you have to live with when you're gardening in mother nature, but don't panic. Okay, so the next one is actual mechanical damage. So if you have leaves that are yellow, brown, have breakage or spots or blotches on it, and I'll insert some imagery of what that looks like, well, 
you need to look at whether this is a pest or if this is some sort of mechanical damage. So the way to determine if it's a pest is first, is there visibly pests on that plant? Now, not all pests are super visible and they can be a little bit elusive. The next thing to look at is actually the plant as a whole and making sure that there is only a few leaves in either high traffic areas, areas that are exposed to excessive levels of winds or hail, for Calgary in particular, RIP. If it is in a place of high traffic, if it is in a place that has been exposed to wind, if it has been ripped to shreds by mother nature, those are obviously mechanical damages and it should only be on select few leaves of the plant. Now, if it is in other spaces of the plant, meaning it's on the new leaves all the way to the old leaves, then this is an indication of a pest issue. The other indication of a pest issue is when it's just on the new growth, particularly the really nice tender stuff. Pests, famously, whether it's fungus, bacteria, or actual insects, love, adore a fresh green plant. This is another reason why you want to avoid over-fertilizing because that soft tissue is like a buffet in Vegas for your aphids and everything else. To avoid that, you obviously need to apply pesticides, pull back on the fertilizer, and if possible, prune. And this actually leads me into my next favorite way to increase my yields. So this next one is actually very highly dependent on what's happening in the second one with the identifying of disease and reacting to it accordingly. Now the rule is, when you are pruning your tomato, you do not remove the sucker. And this is more of a tomato specific tip, but it actually would go for anything that fruits and flowers in some capacity. You don't want to remove your fruit or your flower bearing vines or bits and bobs of your plant unless absolute necessary. So the situations in which this is necessary are obviously disease and pests. So you can use tip number two to identify whether or not you have a severe enough issue to intervene and actually prune. But so long as that doesn't exist, your only goal as a gardener for pruning is to increase airflow to prevent disease if you know it's possible in your area. And number two is to increase yields by leaving those suckers on and actually just removing the leaves below the sucker. So the literal leaf that's just sticking out with nothing attached to it. That's the bugger that's got to go. Or you'd be like me and just not prune at all. Does that, does that look like a garden that's been pruned by a professional? No. This is, like I said, why you should never listen to me. So it's a fact that you can and will increase your yield pruning that way, but it is definitely, as you can tell, not something that I do. I just don't touch them. But there are times when I intervene, don't get me wrong, uh, when I'm feeling highly motivated and bored, which is rare this summer, to be honest. Anyways, definitely something to think about. Okay, the next one is another one that is a known fact that it increases yields and does awesome stuff for your garden. But it is also a known fact that I am way too lazy to do it. And that is hand pollination slash aiding in pollination. So we have two types of flowers. We have perfect and imperfect flowers. Perfect means it has both the male and the female parts together. The imperfect ones is just a male or just a female. So examples, tomatoes are perfect and imperfects would be like a squash. If you hand pollinate your squash or your imperfect flowers by going through the process of collecting all your males and then fertilizing your females and doing this repeatedly, you can increase your yield. And I have a whole video on the ins and outs and whys and who's and all, you name it, of the reason for that. For a perfect flower, because everything is inside, the simple movement of that plant can actually increase the yield. So shaking, vibrating, if you have a little bit of downtime or you have minions, aka slave labor under five feet, get them to work, make them start paintbrushing flowers or shaking tomato plants. This one is science-based, but it's based in the world of psychology, and that is knowing when to pivot. So 
What I mean by this is taking the time to properly identify your garden and take an active role and ensuring you don't make the same mistakes next year. So if there are things that went horribly wrong in your garden, that does not mean you're a bad gardener. Uh, that does not mean you suck at gardening and don't know what's going on. What it does mean is either Mother Nature's being a twat, which I mean, if we're being honest, she's got her days. The second one is that you just need to pivot. So if you watch my video on my trial and errors for peppers or my trial and error for tomato video, you know that me, myself, actually take the time to try out different things in my space because all of you geek crew, you know this, we all have different climates. We all have different conditions. And what that means is we all will see different results regardless of what I tell you on this video you just may not have the same experience. People can say it's anecdotal. People can say you just don't know what you're doing, but the reality is that is your reality. So take the time to identify what went wrong, how to pivot, or even better yet, be your own garden scientist and actually try a bunch of different things and see what works for you in your space. Never give up, but don't beat yourself up either because sometimes, sometimes I find the gardening community to be a little bit elitist, which is very, very dumb because it's literally a peasant's hobby. Okay, this one is specific to all cold climate gardeners and let me tell you, you're gonna see awesome results for it. This can work for literally all plants and that is topping. Now, you're probably thinking, actually, topping happens in the spring and it happens with peppers and snapdragons and flowers and that sort of thing, wrong. Well, right, but wrong. See, I can do that because I, I have the camera, but I just like, it doesn't mean anything. Anyways, um, I've got that. Any hoosers, topping. So this is a phenomenon that is just glorious. And that is removing the leading edge of your plant. So the tippity top of your, <clears throat> the tippity top, see the plants, the plants don't want me to like let this info out because they're screaming at me right now because they know what's about to happen. The removal of the leading edge of your plant does glorious things. There is a hormone in the tippity top leading edge of your plant in all plants that's called auxin. And when auxin is chuffed away, it actually redirects a lot of the growth hormone and the growing activities to everywhere else in the plants. So that's fun. And what this can yield in obviously snapdragons and peppers and earlier in the season, house plants, more branching, more leaves, more physical biomass above ground. But when it comes to a plant that knows its days are numbered, such as a tomato or a pepper later in the season or a cucumber or a squash, you start getting your fruits to actually ripen. Yes, that is right. Definitely, definitely one you want to check out. I have a whole video on topping plants, so you can check that out here. I also have a video on bricks, which is the perfect time to harvest your plants. So you may wanna watch that if you wanna know when to harvest your tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers after you have officially topped. Thanks for watching. Talk to you guys next time. Bye.